Pearl Harbor, a U.S. naval base in Hawaii was bombed by the Japanese on December 7, 1941, with the intent of destroying America's Pacific fleet. Air was filled with all kinds of smoke and debris. The noise was unbearable. Just the minute it happened, it came on the radio. War, war, Pearl Harbor was bombing. Even at the young age, I felt that, hey, my life's going to change. Fear erupted in the states of the Pacific coast. Fear that the Japanese and Japanese Americans, called the Nikkei, were carrying out acts of espionage against the state. This prejudice led the Nikkei to be persecuted for their ancestral connection. Pressure from governmental advisors led President Roosevelt to instate Executive Order 9066, calling all alien enemies to be transferred into internment camps due to possible attack and sabotage. One thing that shocked me was, was, was the barbed wire fence and the army guard with rifles. The image thought that came to you, I think, was that it was going to be a prisoner of war. In December of 1944, when the U.S. Major General announced the ending of Japanese internment camps, debates among Seattle residents rose. Through both journalistic exploits and physical marginalization, anti-Japanese sentiment grew due to the false propaganda provided by the Remember Pearl Harbor League, who acted on their economic interests. Only with the unique two-way diplomatic intervention from the Seattle Council of Churches did these racial debates on Japanese resettlement resolve? Seattle Soul After Internment White farmers in Washington state had formed the Remember Pearl Harbor League, or RPHL, with the intent to seek action and take stand for keeping the Nikkei away for the safety of the U.S. They feared the economic loss that would come with the return of skilled Nikkei farmers after internment. Similar to this notion, Seattle's mayor, William Devon, initially opposed the resettlement of the Nikkei. He believed that their return would bring disorder into the Seattle area. But after the government's announcement, he backed down from his anti-Japanese position and promised equal rights and protection for the Japanese community. However, this stance was not supported by all political officials. Washington's governor, Monrad Walgren, on January 23, 1945, made an emphatic statement that the return of the Nikkei would be damaging due to the possible collaboration with Japan. He was visibly perturbed and in support of anti-resettlement groups, including the RPHL. Walgren's anti-Japanese remarks were denounced by the Seattle Council of Churches, who shared their pro-Japanese resettlement views. The representatives believed in the Christian values of hospitality to promote racial harmony. The split belief spurred debates in Seattle, where over 7,000 Nikkei were forced out and bound to return. Residents began to voice their personal opinions in interviews and letter submissions to various newspapers, Though these debates were not face-to-face, -face, the mood of Seattle was clearly shifting to a mix of hesitation and bitterness towards the Nikkei and their supporters. Marjorie Hines, a Boeing worker, says to the Seattle Star newspaper, They should never come back. Our boys are finding them and don't want to come back and see a bunch of Japanese around here. Another resident, a janitor named Leonard Goldsmith, tells them, Somebody should be arrested for ever thinking of bringing the Japanese back. We don't want them, and since they know that, they shouldn't want to come back. As Goldsmith suggested, it was true that the Nikkei feared returning, since they didn't know what attitude to expect. But many eventually returned, possibly due to the nonviolent debates showing them that some white people were on their side. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer quotes Hayden Millis, a finance company operator. If the army feels it's all right for them to return, we have no quarrel with that ruling. He continues, it is not a question of sentiment, but of constitutionality. The debate proves to be successful with accounts for a wide variety of everyday people in the Seattle area, but the debate was flawed when considering that it was only about the Nikkei rather than with them. Though this flaw remained, newspapers continued to be a place for residents to rival. The conflict was maximized by the RPHL, who exploited the newspapers for their own advertising of anti-Japanese beliefs. 
majority of the RPHL members were in the agricultural industry, so there were few applied members in Seattle. Yet their stance in the debate stuck with many residents, and soon the debate spilled off the pages and into the streets. Residents hung posters in front of stores, restaurants, and Nikkei residences to ostracize them from society. I was shocked. I was angry. When the people came back uh, to Seattle, especially in the Kent area, Valley area, especially, no Japs allowed. Japs go home. The debate had now grown into an issue of race and employment. Seattle people too as well. You couldn't even get a job in an American department store. No department store, like even pennies or even a drugstore, they would hire a Japanese American. Though not all companies held racist views, they did sway along with local anti-Japanese beliefs, which impacted the Nikkei's ability to land jobs. Fortunately, the council took an active approach to ease this growing resettlement resistance and debate. Diplomacy comes in many shapes and sizes. In this case, it was a gradual process that was influenced by the citizens' debate, which continued over the newspapers. The council sought to solve the core of the problem. Their diplomatic strategy was made of two different aspects. One, helping the Nikkei directly, and two, addressing the anti-resettlement judgments from the RPHL. They, they open the door and see, see that we were other than Caucasian, and they say, and then knowing that we were Asian, you know, they said, oh, I'm sorry, she says, we just can't sell to you, and we were turned down several times. Understanding the disapproval from the community, council members directed the Nikkei towards modified housing and smaller job opportunities, such as dishwashing and housekeeping. Though it didn't compare with their previous lifestyles, it helped families for the time being. Catching wind of the council's actions of helping the Nikkei with integration, the RPHL criticized them in an open letter on May 11, 1945. They questioned the council if they were unmindful of the menace that the Nikkei will be and called their support as misguided efforts similar to the Trojan horse. However, the RPHL's attempt to intimidate was cut short. Reverend Eugene Murphy, a council leader, replied, the council know far more than any member of your league and call the attention that attacks on racial minorities usually react disastrously on the attackers. He asserts his position to change the minds of the RPHL and decrease the conflict they may bring. As a diplomat, he takes this moment to let the RPHL rethink their position to become ethically just. If they did this, their economic desire to make money could be achieved by working with the community. As an open letter, this changed the perspectives of former RPHL supporters in Seattle. Through these actions, the council eased the debate, but their true motivations behind their compassionate gestures were not as straightforward as it may first seem. The council had the hidden motive of forcing Japanese to assimilate into Caucasian culture. This is made clear with the delay in reopening the Japanese Baptist Church in Seattle. Reverend Emery Andrews, both diplomat and council member, urged for its reopening to support the Nikkei with resettlement. His son now recalls. And it was their resolution, their, their hot button, their hobby horse was to integrate the returning Japanese into the Caucasian churches. And um, my dad was very much against that. The council viewed that it would be better for the Nikkei to assimilate into white churches in order to form a casual connection between the community and the returning Japanese. However, their attempts to encourage integrated churches failed, particularly because of the support and persuasion from Reverend Andrews and council members of similar views. Within the same year, the Japanese Baptist Church was reopened and allowed the Seattle community to make that casual connection in a new way. As Reverend Andrew's son now recalls, the reopening was. First of all, to show the Caucasian community that, that uh, the Japanese are not a threat to community, that they can be uh, just as Caucasian as anybody else in the community. With their diplomatic efforts, the Nikkei faced fewer acts of hatred towards them and began to find support in the initially resistant community. 
The council, speaking out against the anti-Japanese movements, created room for the residents to have a change of heart. This shift was made clear on May 12, 1945, when the RPHL held a meeting in Seattle's Beacon Hill and stated, Pioneers had taken this country away from the Indians, and now the Japanese are trying to take it away from us. Taken aback by such a flawed and distorted claim, the Seattle residents burst into laughter, and the differing views within the community had begun to fade. However, in the farming community, there was a contractual agreement. The RPHL had gotten part of what they wanted. Few Nikkei farmers successfully regained their land, so after internment, Seattle's public Pike Place market remained a white majority. Some might view this as diplomacy, however, it can only be considered diplomatic if the end result was both just and agreed upon. This consequence was not a mutual agreement and was a failure in the council's advocating for the Nikkei farmers. But the council achieved their hope as diplomats to acknowledge the RPHL supporters and shift their point of view to see the Nikkei as part of their community. In December of 1945, Seattle's YM and YWCAs conducted a survey to evaluate the anti-Japanese sentiment. The no-Japanese propaganda had decreased from every corner to just 12 signs in the produce row. The study showed that there was an improvement of 5 Nikkei per 25, finding less discrimination from an economic aspect. The anti-Japanese sentiment dwindled. With time and community involvement, Seattle accepted the Nikkei and increased racial tolerance. Today, the economic and social contributions of the Nikkei are presented as murals at the Seattle Pike Place Market and in an exclusion memorial in Bainbridge Island. The Council of Churches was a prominent contributor to reshaping Seattle's soul. They successfully moved residents away from ulterior motives of the member Pearl Harbor League and toward acceptance, no matter where people came from. <laughs>